Amen. Kind of an oldie. Have you heard that one before? Yeah, it's good. Appreciate that so much. Appreciate all of our church family that gets together and helps us with music and with uh, all the elements that we do here, prayer and, and offering and everyone that helps out. It really is a great thing to be part of a church family. Just bow your heads with me. Lord, we are so privileged to be able to be here today and we just ask that the spirit of worship would continue in our hearts as we turn now to the message and the study of your word, Lord. May it be your beauty and your word that is heard in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tony, if I grab a couple mics here, can we try having some volunteers for the kids' quiz so kids can speak in the mic? Yeah, if we could find Mitch, Mitch will help out. Oh, look at this. I want you to know these are elders of the church right here. See how quickly they jumped up? That's what we love to see. Appreciate that, guys. Um, just before before you can you can maybe just sit down for a second. I want to just introduce the message for a second. Um, I'm doing something new here at Scottsdale Thunderbird. Today's the fifth Sabbath. It's kind of a bonus Sabbath, George. And so I love I love it. Um, and uh, but what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to begin a series of sermons. Now the reason that I I uh, introduce that that way it's extremely hard to do that here at Scottsdale Thunderbird. Uh, because we have so many other activities that happen. Uh, we have guest speakers, we have youth church, and so typically you want to have a consistency, but I'm going to try it anyways. I've been praying about it, and I've actually been planning on this for some time, so you may not uh, always come every week, and it'll be part two, part three, part four, but every time that I have a chance to speak for the most part, I'm going to be building on uh, an idea here of faith matters. Faith matters. Um, and kind of one of the uh, uh, things that is... Uh, in, it came to my mind as I was uh, putting these thoughts together and uh, uh, putting the message together. Is when my wife and I became Seventh-day Adventists, um, of course, it was uh, something that we had to uh, work out through the rest of the family uh, who uh, did not value that decision or maybe were concerned about that decision, particularly among uh, our more religious family uh, who felt that that was a, a problem, uh, to put it mildly. Um, and I remember on several occasions when we would try talking uh, talking about the differences in, if I don't pace myself here, I might start preaching. So be careful. Um, I really thought, I really honestly, and to this day, I haven't really given up on the thought. I really thought that the easiest bridge for my Christian family that were not Seventh-day Adventists um, would be to, to discuss eternal hell. Because I thought of any belief, if you could get rid of that belief in your life, wouldn't you want to? I mean, if you could be shown a pathway where you don't have to believe that people will be tortured forever uh, and you could be released of that. So I really thought that would be the bridge. And I thought, well, let's start there. So when they would ask about what we've changed in our thinking, I would you know, usually begin with eternal hell and say, well, as I've looked at the scriptures, it seems very clear that that's inconsistent with the character of God. And let's talk about the passages that say that uh, hell is eternal death, not eternal life. And da, 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 da. But the, the point that I'm getting to is that as we discussed, it, sometimes the discussion, you know, you're not supposed to talk about politics and religion with family, right? Because those always lead to arguments, you know, and how it gets. Well, sometimes our discussions would get elevated. And uh, there were peacemakers within the family. There would be an aunt here or a cousin here who they'd be listening. And when the discussions got heated, we don't say argument. We don't argue as a family in the scene. We would have heated discussions. Uh, invariably, one of the more peacemakers of the family would kind of stand up and in, declare in a loud voice, well, what does it matter anyways? Right? You know, what does it matter? God will solve it all. We'll be dead anyways, right? We'll be dead. You know, talking about um, uh, our belief about death being asleep, right? Uh, taking grandma and grandpa out of heaven, that's that's big. That's a big deal to those who believe. No, no, grandma's in heaven. That's a big deal, and people. And so we'd have the peacemaker. Usually, it was again one of my aunts or my cousin who would stand up and say, "Well, what does it matter? What does it matter what we believe on this? What does it matter about the Sabbath? What does it matter?" Now, to a degree, winning an argument doesn't matter, and I agree with that. Winning an argument does not help us in our uh, 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 helping to express our faith or, or convince people of what we believe. You know, you've heard uh, the little pithy saying, uh, 
mind changed against his will is of the same opinion still, right? So winning an argument surely doesn't matter. But it does beg the question, does what we believe matter? Does faith matter? And when you, you can say it either faith matters, and then the emphasis is on faith, or you can say it faith matters, which would emphasize matters of faith. And that's on purpose, Sandy. Don't be confused. It'll all become clear with the Lord's blessing. So I want to talk about matters, faith matters over the next few weeks. So we are stuck in studying the book of Hebrews in Sabbath school. And if there's any book of the Bible that talks about faith, it is the book of Hebrews with their great hall of faith uh, passage. And I'm struggling with uh, this, George, so if you can help me out. I, I am. It's definitely on. It worked for you guys, didn't it? You broke it. We love technology. It's so wonderful when it works. And we want to throw it out the window when it doesn't work. <laughs> Somehow Jesus managed to preach without PowerPoint. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. And we can survive without it as well, but it would sure be helpful. You know what? Um, while they're working on that, um, I can do the kids quiz. You want to try it again? There we go. We're going to give it a try. We're going to be looking at the different people of faith in the book of Hebrews. So we've got Mitch with a mic here. We've got Nassim with a mic here. Uh, the mics are helpful, particularly for those watching at home, because if it doesn't go through the system, they don't hear it. And also it helps the rest of us here. I always begin my messages, uh, generally speaking, with a kid's quiz. So who are we talking about? By faith, he offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, which through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Who are we talking about here? All right, yeah, right here. Abel. You are right, Abel. I keep getting them confused. Sean. Where's Eric? Oh, you're right there. Sorry. Thank you, Sean. You are right, we're talking about Abel. By faith, Abel. It was through faith that he offered to God a better sacrifice. So it wasn't a sacrifice of works. It was an act of faith. All right, next one. By faith, he was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. Okay, uh, I see Jacob. Thank you. And I don't mind uh, seeing and Mitch helping out. Enoch. Enoch, that's right. Enoch, it's a great Bible study to think about the whole experience of Enoch. We don't know a lot about him, uh, but the analysis of, analysis of how that work um, is wonderful. I like how Ellen White puts it in Patriarchs and Prophets. He says that God simply opened the portals of heaven and he stepped through as stepping from one room to another. And I just think that's a beautiful image of what it was like when Enoch was taken up. Anyways, next one. By faith, he, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. All right, I... I see pointing. All right, we'll go with Ketsia here. I saw your hand, Jonathan. I'm sorry. We're going to Ketsia a chance on this. Noah. You are right. Noah is the right one we're looking for. By faith, Noah did all the things that he did and listened to God. In reverence, he prepared an ark, became an heir of righteousness. So faith, pretty important in these stories. Next one. By faith, he, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Who are we talking about here? Oh, I saw, is that right? Well, well hold on, that doesn't count. <laughs> we want to hear it, brother. Abraham. He is right. Abraham, by faith, Abraham, when he was called. Sounds like that was a big deal for him. Last one, last one. By faith, even she herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Who is this talking about? By faith, she. Well, all right, Jonathan, I held you back. I'm sorry, I already denied Jonathan. We'll see. He probably won't get it right. 
Sarah. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Got to put you on the spot there. So you are right. By faith, thank you, Nassim and Mitch. Sarah herself. I think they're... Uh, I think there required some uh, works in that experience as well, but by faith she did receive the ability to conceive. Um, now back there in Hebrews eleven six, there is this little verse that says, "Without faith, it is what? Without faith, it is impossible to please Him." I want to just spend a moment on that to explain. It doesn't mean that God is perpetually unhappy with us. It doesn't mean that we are to appease God, that he's an angry, wrathful God, and it's only through acts of faith and sacrifice that we can uh, appease his wrath. That is, that's a pagan way of thinking about God, and that's not what is intended here. What it's talking about here with pleasing God is more of a technical idea of satisfying a requirement. You know, if your boss says, I need this done by noon, if you want to please your boss, when do you need to have it done by? <laughs> Some of you wouldn't even earn by 11.30. You need to have it done by noon, right? There is something that is expected in order to satisfy what is required. Now, the only thing that will satisfy God is perfection. Did you know that? The only thing that will please God is perfection. Nothing short of that will satisfy the righteous requirement of his character and his law and for the eradication of sin. Now, I say that directly and with strength, not to be harsh and not to be complicated, but that is simply the Bible truth. Nothing short of perfection will satisfy God. But let me let me put this in another context that I think will, will uh, bring a little bit more flesh to those dry bones, okay? If you knew that your child had a deadly disease, okay, and you're, the, the doctor said, came to you and said, well, I've got good news. We've healed part of it. Now, you would be thrilled to know that there had been progress, right? You'd be like, oh, okay, well, what does that mean? No, 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 they still have the disease, and they're still going to suffer, and they're still going to die. Would you be pleased to hear that? The only thing you want to hear, if you're a parent, is we have perfectly removed the disease. It is gone. It will not afflict them anymore. They are free from it. They will have life. They will have opportunity now. The only thing that will be pleasing to you as a parent will to know that that entire dilemma has been removed from their life. Yes, there can be progress. Yes, there can be, you know, improvement. But until you get to the place knowing that they are freed from that completely, will you have complete satisfaction as a parent that that life can then be restored, that life can now uh, 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 pursue it, itself to the fullest. And that's what sin is in our lives, friends. God doesn't want to partially remove sin. God doesn't want to temporarily bring improvement to our life. He wants to perfectly heal us. And the Bible says it is only by faith that that can happen. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Faith then obviously matters. It matters deeply. It matters desperately. And we live in a day and an age where it is being de-emphasized to such a degree that I think is dangerous. So uh, th this first message, by the way, is mostly an introduction to the series, if I can put it that way. Faith matters. And technology does not matter. There it is. Listen to what Paul says here in Romans. And I'm going to show you this in a couple of ways. Preached from Romans last week. This is kind of a dovetail to this week into Romans. Brethren, he says in, in Romans 10, verses 1 and 2, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, and we'll talk about who the them is in here in a second, in a second is for their salvation. And this is Paul. He loves to see people brought to the truth, loves to see people perfected in faith, right? I want to see them brought to salvation. But then he says this, For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, they are sincere. They are authentic. They are in truly trying to pursue the things of God. But not in accordance with knowledge. They are missing something critical to their salvation and their faith. They have all the sincerity in the world. They have all the zeal that they need. But they're missing knowledge. 
Now, who's he talking about here? Let's read it from the New Century Version. This version was written with a fifth grade vocabulary, so it's written so that words are understandable to um, a greater, broader audience. Brothers and sisters, the same thing I want most is for who? All the Jews. That's what he's talking about here. That's the them. Uh, the, what I want for the Jews is them for them to be saved. That's my prayer to God. I can say this about them. They really try to follow God. He's not condemning of his brethren. He's not condemning of those who've not yet accepted the fullness of the rev revelation of Christ. He acknowledges they're doing their best. But what's the problem? But they do not know the right way. They are lacking. And because of that lacking, they're missing out on salvation. He doesn't say, I'm just trying to improve their salvation. I'm not just trying to help them be better in their salvation. He says, I'm praying for their salvation because they have all the sincerity. They have all the zeal. They have all the effort. But if we lack the essential ingredient of understanding, of wisdom, and of knowledge, all the sincerity in the world is worth nothing. And you hear this all the time. Oh, they're a very sincere person. They are really trying. They are very sincere. And I'm not putting that down. We want zealousness. We want sincerity. We're not trying to say that that is, is worthless. But balanced on the scales of the need of faith and salvation, it is left wanting. It is left wanting. Now, we can spend a long time defining what faith is and all that. There's been big books written about it. I'm just going to illustrate it very uh, simply in this way. We often think of faith as these elements being devoted, being committed, uh, acting out our faith, right? Doing good works. Ritual, ceremony is part of our faith. Grace, compassion, mercy. Those are, are, are uh, you know, how many people manifest or think of faith, okay? There's nothing wrong with these things. We talk about them a lot in the church. We should be devoted, committed, and we should do acts of kindness and benevolence. And there should be, there is a place for ritual and ceremony. There is a place for grace and compassion. Okay, all those things are important. But the other side of the ledger, faith is reflection, contemplation, doctrine, belief, our thoughts, and truth. Are these not also elements of faith? Former president of um, uh, the Princeton Seminary, Dr. John McKay, in a speech once said that commitment without reflection is fanaticism, but reflection without commitment is paralysis. Commitment without reflection is fanaticism, but reflection without commitment is paralysis. I want to I want to give you an illustration right now. It's very dangerous. Ooh, dangerous. I might step in some, some pretty sacred waters here. This week, my, my daughter um, had a half day on Wednesday. So I decided to go home that, after nine, excuse me, that afternoon and spend some time um, with my daughter since my wife was at work and the rest of the kids were still in school. So we decided to watch one of her favorite movies, Free Willy. Free Willy. You all seen Free Willy? Yeah. Free Willy, right? Fun story. Good story. Wholesome kid redemption, learning to be, you know, a good kid. And mm, Free Willy. Well, it reminded me of the story of Willy. You know that there was a real whale that was filmed for that, okay? A lot of the close-ups were done with, you know, fake whale, animatronics, and that type of stuff. But the, the, the view of a real was a real whale. Do you remember his name? It wasn't Willie. Keiko. Keiko was that whale's name. Keiko was the name of the whale. It was filmed at a real park. Um, it was a real whale that was used for the storytelling in the movie. And when at the end of the movie, that whale jumps over uh, the little kid, I forgot his name, Jesse, you know, and goes out and swims to freedom. You remember that moment and your heart just bursts with, oh, and he's with his little whale family. Do you know that that moment created a massive outpouring of support for Keiko? And in the mid 90s, little kids were breaking open their piggy banks 
and sending it to the to the whale conservation society and writing letters saying free Keiko. I mean, we just saw Willie Freed in the movie, and he was so happy. We don't want Keiko to be in his little uh, captive enclosure. Now, here's the. I am not here to talk about the benefits of whales in captivity versus freeing whales. That's a fine debate and discussion about the ethics and humanity. Okay, that's not the point. Okay, I just want to be careful here because people are very sensitive about their whales. Very intelligent creatures, by the way. Very intelligent creatures. They may be about the most intelligent creatures on the planet. Maybe other than humanity. <laughs> very, They're very sensitive. Um, anyways, here, here's what I'm getting at. So for about 10 years, a huge massive outpouring came to free Keiko. But here was the problem. There was commitment. There was devotion. I think the reflection was lacking. Most of the whale experts and marine biologists said this is dangerous. He was captured when he was two. He's been in captivity for over 20 years. He has only learned to eat dead fish by hand. He's never even associated with other marine biology. He has been in total captivity. We don't know if he is prepared and ready and willing to be released into the wild, but the energy and the enthusiasm would not hold up. So in 2002, Keiko was flown to Iceland. He was released into the wild. And within a year, Keiko was dead. He was 27. Whale, orca whales live about the same length of life as we do. Okay? So if you were told that a 27-year-old man had died, you would probably say their life was cut short. Right? Within a year, he never learned to fish. He never would learn to associate with another whale pod. They had monitors and watchers. As a matter of fact, if you've ever seen the documentary about Luna, the whale that got caught up in British Columbia, uh, the Ryan Reynolds, Scarlett Johansson, well worth your time, friends. It's called The Whale. Anyways, orcas, incredibly intelligent animals. He, uh, Keiko swam up to a Norwegian fishing village, and he found fishermen, and he came to them crying for their attention. They got, and they didn't all know the story and everything. They just see this massive orca, you know, coming at them. But at, as they began to see this guy's kind of domesticated, they began to pet him. Children climbed on his back, and, and he was now back with humans. And, of course, those trying to build conservation said, we can't have this, so they made a law. Don't touch Keiko. Don't go near Keiko. He died of malnutrition and of pneumonia. Now, here's the point. Nobody wanted that. The sincerity was there. The commitment was there. The kids breaking their piggy banks. That does, that's, not, that's wonderful. That's compassion. That's grace. They wanted to see that happen. But it lacked wisdom. It lacked reflection. It lacked a willingness to think about the consequences. And as a result, Keiko would still probably be alive today. But as a result, he died. And we could talk about this uh, in other many examples of how people can be very committed to things. You say, that's wonderful. What is it about that that you like? I don't know. I just have uh, always voted Republican. I, I don't know. Why do you support that movement? Because they're so exciting. Well, what do they believe? What do they stand for? They just stand. So commitment without reflection is fanaticism. And then on the other side, if you simply think about things, and you can think good things, but are never willing to do anything about them, uh, McKay calls that paralysis. I think I call that hypocrisy. And we all know people like that. They can point out all the ills of the world. Oh, there's so much crime. And oh, there's pollution's terrible. Oh, and the homeless and the hungry kids and education needs to be. Say, great, have you voted? Well, they're all corrupt crooks. I don't vote. Okay, okay. Well, do you volunteer? Do you volunteer for your church or your school? Do you go down to the homeless center? I don't have time for that. You know? Oh, okay. Do you donate? Do you give to these wonderful causes? Do you? I don't have time for that. I don't do that. You may have all the good ideas in the world, but they're unwilling to step out and do anything for that. That's hypocrisy, right? Faith is both of these things. It's not one or the other. You can't simply think the right things but not do anything, but you can't just do things without thinking about them. Faith is both. 
find the things that God has called us to root ourselves in, learn as much about them so we can appreciate them. When you think about a lot of the errors of, of uh, uh, history, of where Israel went wrong and where the medieval church went wrong and, and where other uh, groups have gone wrong, a lot of times it's because they get this out of balance. You talk, and friends, I want to be very sensitive here. You know, I, I love all people. I have Catholic friends and family and, and people that I, I connect with. But when I ask the average Catholic, why do you kneel before you get into your pew at church? You know, a good Catholic does that. A Catholic will kneel before they enter the pew at church. Why do you do that? I have yet to have one Catholic be able to tell me why. I know why, because I have a catechism. I've read it. Okay? When I ask, why do you dip your finger in water when you come into there? They're, here's the point. They're filled with ritual. And God loves ritual. There's all kinds of place for ritual. But ritual without knowledge is hollow. Right? So we need to understand why we do things and appreciate them or they lose their meaning and their value. And I could, I could use Adventist examples as well. I'm not trying to pick on one uh, area that... Uh, well, you know, why are you a vegetarian? I don't know. Because meat's evil, right? You go to hell if you eat meat. <laughs> right? No. Anyways. I want to give you an example and why I think this is appropriate. Um, this might seem like a little left of a left turn to you about why I believe faith matters. It seems evident to me that when we think about what the devil does in our world, he begins he always begins with deception. Sometimes when we think about the Antichrist and the works of the devil, we always rush to the militant side. Oh, it's going to be armies and coercion and force and guns and, and uh, do or die type stuff. And that, those things are, are in, uh, in the Bible as far as the wrath and the, the persecution that's faced and all that. But it always begins with deception. Always begins with deception. I want you to notice this uh, little passage. It seems very odd here in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, the apostles have been preaching and the Jews don't like it, so they're trying to stop them. So they've arrested the apostles, and now they're trying to figure out what to do. Okay, And that's where we pick up the story. Acts chapter 5. A Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by the people, stood up in the council, gave orders to put the apostles outside for a short time. That's who the men are. Put them outside. I want to talk privately. Now, how Luke got this information is very interesting. Obviously, there was a spy among the... Um, this is the Sanhedrin. So someone in the Sanhedrin was listening, and they give the information to Luke, who writes this story later. Um, so anyways, he puts them out, and Gamaliel said to them, men of Israel, take care what you propose to do to these men. Notice this. And then he gives a couple of historical analogies. For some time ago, Judas, Judas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him, but he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. Gamaliel says people like Christ have come before. Okay, that's what he's saying. People claiming to be the Messiah have come before, and they were destroyed and nothing became of that. Then he mentions another one. After this man, Judas of Galilee. Now, where did Jesus come from? He came from Nazareth, and much of his ministry was based in Galilee. Rose up when? The days of the census. Now, what does that bring to your mind? When Jesus was born and drew away some people after him, he too perished and all those who followed him were scattered. So what Gamaliel is saying here is right about the time this Jesus came up, these others came up. These false, uh, well, he, of course, they thought Jesus was false. These other claimants of being the Messiah also seemed to appear out of nowhere. They came to nothing. And then he goes on to say, so in this present case, I say to you, stay away from these men, let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it's going to be overthrown. But if it's of God, you will not be able to overthrow them or else you may even be found fighting against God. Now, here's the interesting thing that uh, it strikes me as someone who appreciates history and prophecy and scripture. Just as God, does, does the devil know prophecy, friends? Does he understand that God has a plan that he's slowly unraveling? Okay, so just as God, is fulfilling prophecy at bringing forth the Messiah, just as he's reestablishing and reintroducing truth, just as he sends the Messiah, so does the devil raise up false truth, false prophets, and false prophecy. The devil knew that God's about to do something powerful. I better produce some counterfeits. You follow me? 
Now, this is not just a one-time event. I believe you can trace it right through the Bible. Every time God raises up a new powerful plan, brings up a, a king or a messiah or a prophet, at the same time, you will see false uh, uh, false messages and false prophecy come out with great emphasis. And I could go through a lot of biblical um, analogies of this way, but, but um, this morning I want to bring up a historical one from uh, the history of our church. We were founded in 1863, okay? Seventh-day Adventist Church formally becomes a, a legal entity and denomination in 1863. When you think about that era of time, just as many false movements were coming up when Jesus came, right as God's fulfilling prophecy in 1844, right as many of the powerful things that God is doing in raising up a new remnant people with reestablished understanding of Jesus Christ and of biblical truth, wouldn't you know that the devil is also at work? So in 1830, the Book of Mormon is published. In 1875, Science and Health, which is the primary document of Christian science, Mary Baker Eddy's book, is published. In 1881, Charles Taze Russell's Watchtower Society, which is the um, legal name for Jehovah's Witnesses, is founded. Okay? Now, I am not here to uh, condemn or criticize other groups and denominations. We just respectfully not only disagree with their analysis and their their uh, uh, their way of portraying Christ, we feel it is inappropriate what these organizations do with the historical Christ. We feel we feel that they are in gross error, okay. And it just so happens, right as God was raising up what I believe to be the remnant church in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, at the same time, these other twisted ways of thinking about Christ were also finding prominence, okay. Now, when I was in the evangelical church, when I was a Pentecostal, and we would study other denominations and things like this, they would have you believe that these three groups were just about ready to take over the world. <laughs> these three, watch out for those Mormons, man. They are taking over everything. Watch out. Don't, don't talk to those Jehovah's Witnesses at the door because they are just about to twist and turn everything. And the only reason I point that out, they have never really had significant worldwide influence. The Mormon church is strong in some areas, um, five or six million Mormons in the world. Um, so we wouldn't really say that Mormons are, how many of you even know a Christian scientist? Do any of you know a Christian scientist? A couple of you do know a Christian scientist. There's not that many. Um, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are slightly larger than the other two. They have never had the type of worldwide impact uh, that I think we are sometimes led to believe. But it just so happens that they were also raised up and still exist at the same time uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But you want to know some movements that I think are even more dangerous that came up at this time? Oh, I'm holding you in bated breath here, aren't I? In 1859, Origin of the Species is published. As a matter of fact, it was in 1844 that Darwin printed his first sketches of Origin of the Species. At the exact time God was bringing up a denomination devoted to the belief that the God of creation continued to believe that the Sabbath of creation is still a wonderful doctrine to be embraced, so also does the theory of evolution find its most significant origin. Oh, what, is it, what happened here? In 1867, Karl Marx uh, publishes Das Kapital, a godless humanistic movement that, that removes human dignity from society and human government. And in 1865, in Tennessee, Nathan Bedford Forrester helps found the Ku Klux Klan. I think these movements are of much greater danger to the truth and to the faith of Jesus Christ in the last days. At the exact same time that God is raising up a true movement, so is the devil raising up counter. What do you think is going to happen in the very last days? Do you think the devil has more deceptions and counterfeits in store for us? Is now the time to throw up our hands and say, what does it matter? Or is now the time to really dig deep and say, it matters what we believe. It matters. 
Think of how different things would have been if Saul believed the truth about soul sleep. He wouldn't have gone to the witch of Endor and be misled and ended up bringing destruction to Israel and his own suicide. Think about how if Israel had really appreciated the truth about the Messiah and had not rejected him. Think about what powerful people Christ would have been able to raise up if they regarded the truths of Scripture with greater intensity and had not rejected the Messiah. Faith matters. I throw this next screen up here just as a, uh, when I was preparing this and trying to remind myself of some of the history of Christian science and things like that, I just, you know, Google is a interesting thing. Uh, let's just, so then it gives you these pre-populated additional questions. Uh, what does Christian science differ from Christianity? Do Christian scientists believe in medical treatment? What is Christian science called? Then is Jehovah's Witness, which I don't even know what that means. And then the last one, what do Seventh-day Adventists believe? We are so often getting lumped in with these groups. As a matter of fact, another story about when I gave a Seventh-day Adventist, and I'm almost done. I promise I'm almost done. Um, I was at work talking with a buddy of mine. He was a devout Christian, um, and he knew I'd become a Seventh-day Adventist, and we were talking, and uh, we were not arguing. We were talking, and he was just saying, Dave, what are you doing about this and that? And, and one of our managers overheard, and he said, what are you guys talking about? And my friend Rusty said, oh, well, Dave has decided to become a Seventh-day Adventist. And the manager, whose name was Heath, a very nice guy, he goes, oh, yeah, Jehovah's Witness. No! We're not Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, there are certain things that we both promote health and we think of the body as being very special and da-da-da-da-da, but it just we always get lumped in with them. But did Jesus get lumped in with false movements? Did they claim that he had a demon in him? We shouldn't be surprised. In the last day, the truth will also be castigated as untrue. Jesus makes it clear, friends. When, when talking to us about the last days, notice what he says here in just three verses of Matthew 24. When the disciples were asking how to know about his second coming, he says, Jesus answered and said to him, see to it that no one misleads you. How many false prophets will arise? A couple, two, three. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And then in verse 24, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and sh show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. The devil always begins with deception. So before the persecution begins with, with uh, violence and with uh, intensity of you know arresting and things like that, he will always try to deceive you first. Faith matters. We need to know what we believe. And we need to believe it with sincerity and with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. What we believe matters. Who we believe matters. And why we believe it, friends, matters. Again, I take you to... i uh, screen too far. I take you to the passage of Romans. I testify about them. They have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. I invite you to come to the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church every Sabbath, but over the next few weeks, I'm going to be examining what I feel are some key components of our faith that warrant our attention and deep dive into why we believe them and why they matter, because I think it'll help us in these last days. Would you pray with me? Father, I know we have dipped into the uh, beginnings of the afternoon here, and uh, uh, our, our time of worship is growing to a close. Father, I thank you that we can uh, examining these, examine these things together in, in the spirit of, of brotherhood and, and family and sisterhood, Lord, here today. God, be with us, Father, as we, we face incredible questions in the days in which we live. Be with especially, Lord, I lift up our kids uh, who are, are having to deal with things that, that my generation uh, uh, never dealt with. Yes, I may have gotten made fun of for glasses and braces and allergies and things like that, Lord, but today kids are, are faced with gender questions and, and societal issues that uh, we just never dreamed uh, would be such a, a dominant theme in our society. So God, draw us close to you. Help us to know that you are still the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. And we will worship you with all of our heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath. We hope to see you again next week.